In this video, I'd like to talk about mask autoencoders from Facebook AI Research. It's a very cool paper because it gives you the knowledge to pre-train a vision transformer with a large amount of data when you don't necessarily have any label for them. So let's just talk about that. If you know BERT from language models, then you should know that it has a very good property which is pre-training a language model over a large data set. And the idea is great because you can simply scrape lots of text from the internet and use it for your own pre-training dataset when you don't have any label for them. But how? Let's just say we have three samples. The first sample says the man went to the store and then he bought a ticket for the cinema and he went to the cinema with his friends. The idea in BERT is that we can simply mask a portion of the text. Like for the first sentence, we can mask the preposition. For the second one, we can mask the object. And for the third one, we can mask the verb. And now our neural network's objective is to predict what is the missing part. And yeah, just by doing this and pre-training it over a large data set, we have a language model which is by far stronger than just randomly initializing its weights. And now we can fine tune this for different subtasks, like given two sentences, we can fine tune it to output whether these two sentences are similar or not. Or given a single sentence, it can do the things like sentiment analysis and telling that the sentence is positive or negative. Or for questioning answering, or for name entity recognition. But that's for the language models. For the computer vision, in this paper, the authors first ask a question that what makes mass autoencoding different between vision and language? And the answer is that there are three main differences between vision and language. The first difference is difference in architectures. I mean, let's just say that for like three or five years ago, I come and say, what is the dominant architecture in computer vision? You would probably say that it is convolutional neural networks. And we all know that convolutional neural networks, they are working on grids of data, like the three by three kernels. And defining masks for these convolutional neural networks, it is not a straightforward task. But now, with the advance of vision transformers, we can again have tokens. And for tokens, we can define some masks the exact same way that we define them for language models. But there is another difference, and that is the difference in information density. In language models, when I mask like the verb of the sentence, that verb has a high semantic. And when I mask it, you can realize that there's something missing in the text. But let's just say I have a very high resolution image and I remove only a single pixel of that image. You probably wouldn't even understand that. But what if I mask like 16 by 16 portion of the image? You would understand that something is missing but again, it's not so challenging to predict what is the missing part. I can do techniques like taking the mean of adjacent pixels and figure that out what is the missing part. So we have redundancy in vision tasks. And for overcoming this issue, the others propose masking a very high portion of random patches, like 75% of the image. And knowing only 25% of what's going on in the image, it is kind of challenging to predict what are the missing parts. Even for us as humans, it is not a straightforward task. So yeah, we can overcome these two challenges. And the third challenge is that the autoencoder's decoder plays a different role between reconstructing text and images. Because again, in text, we have high semantic of elements. And by using something such as MLP, we can figure that out what is the missing part 
if we have a transformer as our encoder. But for images, it appears that we need something more complicated than MLP, something such as a transformer. So we need a vision transformer for the encoder and some another transformer for the decoder, but they shouldn't exactly be the same and we can have a more lightweight version of it for the decoder. So let's just now see what is the proposed architecture. If you recall from the vision transformers video, when we have the image, the first thing we do is that we divide this image into equal size patches. And having these patches now, we can simply mask a very large portion of it and have a few patches available. And having these few patches, we can give them as the input to our vision transformer. So like before, we do the linear projection just to map the number of channels to a high dimension. And having these tokens now, we add these yellowish vectors, which are absolute position embedding, and give them as our input to this encoder, which is our vision transformer. But as you can see, for this absolute position embeddings, for the first one, I'm not saying that's zero, and I'm saying it is two. And this reason is simply because if I look at the image, the first and the second patches are masked. And the third one, which is the patch number two, if I start from zero, is the one that I'm using. So for the position embeddings, just for the sake of demonstration, I'm saying that this is two and then is six and eight and so on and so forth. And our encoder, when it receives all of these tokens as the input, it simply produces some tokens, which are some latent representation of these tokens. And for understanding what's happening next, I have to tell you something. It's a matter of implementation detail, but it is good to know. I said that at the first step, we are masking a large portion of this image, but in fact, in implementation, they are not doing it. They are doing something else that has the same meaning of masking them out, but it is different. And the thing they do is that when we have these patches, they randomly shuffle all of them. And having these shuffled patches, they pick only the first few patches, like the first 25%. And the remaining 75%, they throw it away, and it has the same effect of masking them out, right? Because we just only select the 25% of them, which they are randomly picked because of the random shuffle we have at first. But if I do this for the tokens, they are not in the sorted order, and instead they are having a different order because of the shuffling part. And because of that, our encoder output should also have a different order, but ultimately I want to reconstruct an image, and the order does matter. So I have an unshuffling part after that, it just stores what are the operations that they did for the shuffling, and it does the reversing of what it did. And then we have all of them sorted and we add these gray tokens. So the blue tokens here are the output of the encoder and the gray tokens are just some randomly initialized vectors that they are learnable through backpropagation and they should give us a latent representation of the missing parts. And now, when we have all of these tokens, we can give them as the input to our decoder plus some position embedding because we need to preserve the order and the decoder should output some tokens. And just by reshaping it, we expect to have some image that is like of what we have as the input, but it should predict what are the missing parts. So for the last function, we have this target image and the predicted one should have the same shape and we do the mean squared error for every pixel pairs 
between target and the prediction. And finally, we expect to predict the missing parts. And if we look at the result for the pre-training, we can say this, that for the first column, if they are the original images, by masking like 75% of the patches, we can see that after predicting what are the missing part, it does it very well. But as I increase the masking ratio to 85% or 95%, the task becomes more challenging, such that for 95%, it becomes all blurry. But one thing that I would like you to know here is that let's just focus on this sample. You can see that there are only a few patches available for the input, but when we look at the output, the same patches are blurry while the rest are having a better quality. That is simply because for the loss function, we do the pixel comparisons for the missing patches, and the neural network does not care for the patches that they are already available, and simply because of that, those patches are kind of blurry we can replace it from the input if we care about the final quality but that's not even important because we need to pre-train an encoder just to realize what's happening in the image and that's it for the pre-training now that we pre-trained we can throw away the decoder and only keep the encoder for our own subtask so during training for our own task, like an image classification, we have two options. Either we can fine tune this encoder or we can do the linear probing. But what's the difference? So let's just say I want to use this pre-trained encoder for the task of image classification. What I do is that I add a linear layer following this encoder and the output of this encoder goes to this linear layer and it outputs some class scores. For fine tuning, I need to change the weight of encoder and the linear layer, both of them, during the fine tuning. But for the linear probing, I can freeze the weights of this encoder and only train the linear layer. And yeah, these are two different strategies that I can do for my subtask. But does it work? Actually it does, otherwise it wouldn't be a paper for sure, but let's just see what is the improvement. So for the first column, they say if we train the vision transformer from scratch for image classification, the original paper reported 76.5 percent. But with the implementation of this paper, without any pre-training, they improved the result to 82.5% without any pre-training. So they did a couple training tricks that if you are interested, you can check them out on the paper. And they simply, by doing them, increased the performance to 82.5. And now if we pre-train this vision transformer by using this mass autoencoding technique we can improve the performance to 84.9 percent and that is interesting because for the data set they are using ImageNet 1k and for both the pre-training and fine-tuning they didn't change the data set they always used ImageNet 1k and that's kind of interesting because without using any additional data we can improve the performance of our vision transformer. And the final thing that I'd like to point out in this video is the effect of changing masking ratio on fine tuning and linear probing. On the figure at the top, we can see that for the fine tuning, the masking ratio is not that important. So if I change it from 40% to 80%, the result is almost the same and that's not that important. But for linear probing, as I increase the masking ratio, the performance becomes better until some extent, like 75%. And after that, the performance decreases. So since 75% works very good for both fine tuning and linear probing, we can use it as a very good measure for masking ratio.
And yeah, that's all I wanted to present in this video. If you more interested to know, for example, what is the decoder design and that type of thing, I encourage you to look at it from the paper. And uh, yep, if you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until the next video, goodbye.